Uh, well, friends, uh, I'm going to talk about something which bothers uh, most of us and uh, the, where the situation usually turns complex for us, and uh, that is the proliferative vitreoretinopathy. Uh, you know, th this term was coined sometimes in 1983, again uh, by the uh, Retina Society uh, uh, at that time. And uh, as we all know, only about 5 to 10 percent of all uh, regmatogenous retinal detachment, uh, you will have uh, proliferative vitreoretinopathy. And uh, it is more common after surgery. And uh, we have a rather bigger problem. Sometimes if you are not careful and remove the hyaloid nicely and you have put in a gas, you have a very severe and a fast a kind of a uh, developing uh, PVR. And uh, of course, we all know we are all vitreoretinal surgeon uh, that the PVR is defined as the growth of the and the contraction of these cellular membrane, uh, both uh, on the surface as well as under the retina. And the PVR is the ma main cause of anatomical and visual fail failure after regmatogenous retinal detachment surgery. And uh, it most often occurs. That's why most of the time when we are doing a surgery, uh, we are telling patients that if your first three months goes well, I think you're going to do well. That's why, because if the PVR is going to happen, it is four to 12 weeks. And uh, it most frequently starts in the inferior quadrant uh, because uh, all these cells, they get liberated and settle inferiorly, like in this particular case. You can see how the retina is trying to contract uh, inferiorly and uh, you have a large tear there and uh, so basically what uh, uh, do you see there there is a white opacification of the retinal surface with wrinkles you may have a posterior rolled edges of the retinal tear decreased mobility of the detached retina fixed folds and funnel shaped retinal detachment like this you may have this kind of increased wrinkling if you have this you know the PVR process has already started and the edge is rolled up like that. So those are, those are the things which you need to look at. Of course, if you have a clear cut fixed fold like this, then of course uh, you are very clear that you are dealing with the uh, PVR here. So I may not really go into the whole detail and both classification, although they are mentioned here. You see, this is the original 1983, which still many of you, us, we use it. The in A is vitreous haze, vitreous pigment clumps, as well as uh, vitreous clumps on the inferior retina. And I mentioned about the wrinkling. I showed you some examples. This retina gets a little stiffened. You have more vascular tortuosity, as well as the rolled and irregular edges of the retinal breaks. And uh, of course, uh, uh, decreasing uh, mo uh, decreased mobility of the vitreous itself. And C, you have a full thickness retinal fold. If it is in one quadrant, you call it C1, same way, two quadrant two and three. If all the four quadrants becomes uh, D, and then is the funnel, whether it is an open, narrow, or a closed funnel. So like this, one ex such example, uh, where I think this is Dr. Raman's patient, where uh, you have these clear cut folds, and sometimes you have a closed funnel like that. Totally, nothing is visible, even the disc is closed. And the revised classification was mainly required because they didn't include in the initial classification uh, that was anterior PVR. So most of these, you see, this has been done way back in 1991, revised uh, again uh, by McNamara et al. And here, first and second are same. But third, they included uh, C, it, this kind of a, uh, for the posterior to the equator and anterior to the equator. Whether it is focal, diffuse, or circumferential, full thickness folds, or subretinal strand. So I think uh, most of the time uh, uh, we may not be using it, but at times it becomes important because we need to kind of go with a particular plan. Uh, so you have a situation like this here. So what you find here is that you have so much of uh, PBR which has developed after surgery that most of this retina looks uh, puckered all around. And uh, basically, what are the risk factors? The risk factors are multiple large or giant tear, retinal detachment with choroidal detachment, vitreous hemorrhage, prolonged inflammation in the eye, 
and long-standing retinal detachment and many a time posterior penetrating trauma. So if you have a large tear, obviously large uh, area is liberating RP cells, is developed our, uh, this thing. What are the risk factors in an operated eye? That's what is important. We want to avoid that. I think uh, previous RD surgery, I already mentioned about use of gas and you have not removed the hyaloid, how bad it becomes. Pre-operative pre-VR itself and failure to remove all tractions from the retina. That is the most important. That's why I colored it a little differently. Of course, if you uh, fail to close the retinal breaks, that will lead to retinal detachment and you have a incarceration of retina, you've done heavy cryo, or you have a uveitis prolonged, you'll have. So this is uh, one such case where you have after uh, sterile buckling surgery. So the treatment basically, if you have something like uh, sterile buckling would be good if you do it in the initial uh, sort of stages, uh, you'll stand very nicely. But if it goes on to C3 onwards, most of the time, you require vitrectomy. And the goals of the surgery are same as in conventional RD surgery, close all breaks, relax with your retinal traction. These goals are achieved with great difficulty in PVR surgery. And the early stages, as I already mentioned, especially in fake eye, in most of the situation in fake eye, tend to do buckling. But if it is a, a fake pseudo fake eye, no evident break, or you have these ERMs associated with RD or a failed buckle, obviously you need a vitrectomy. So you need to remove these membranes. I think I'll show you all the, those things. You can use various things, forcep, pix, membrane scratcher, uh, or a vitreous spatula. I think uh, uh, some of these examples are given here where Uh, now you have these folds here, uh, so once you have done vitrectomy, what, what, what is being shown here on the corner here, and you have uh, tried to remove that posterior hyaloid, that's very important. But posteriorly, once you have removed, you see those fixed folds there. So you need to get rid of these fixed folds, and once you remove and release these fixed folds, and you have nicely taken care of that, so you will get something what you have down there. You see the last bit of a fold. Mostly you tend to go uh, tangentially towards the periphery, but at times you need to do a little bit of a manipulations. And uh, I think the problem is here. Now this is a very tough kind of a hyaloid here. And it is coming only partly and despite MVR being used, this is a little dated uh, kind of a uh, surgery, which is uh, I'm showing. And in this case, triamcinolone will help you. You need to put in this triamcinolone and then try to remove uh, the hyaloid with the assistance of a triamcinolone. So uh, one such case where after vitrectomy, the same one uh, uh, is shown here. What about the sphere PVR? That's what is the big challenge. Sphere PVR requires not only partial or vitrectomy. Most of the time, at least we put always a uh, sterile buckle or a spe especially a 240 band. You require extensive peeling and you may need removal of these bands from anterior, posterior, as well as you may need some time anterior based dissection. Relaxing retinotomy and retinectomies, you try to avoid as much as possible but you may require them, and long-term tamponoid is required. So perfluorocarbon is required to be used. I think I'll be showing as a third hand in such a situation. And uh, of course, we tend, as I said, not to do too many retinotomy and retinectomy. And you need a long-term tamponoid. Most of the time we use silicone oil, but if you can, you can also at times use C3F8. So this is the way we just put a 240 band just to support the peripheral vitreous. And after you have put the 240 band, you, I think, uh, yeah. So a, a, a severe PVR, this is the same case which I have closed funnel. You see, the whole retina looks like as if it is in plaster. Now we have no choice here. This was one eye child, other eye was thysical and blind for a long time. And you can see how long perhaps this retina must have been detached. The retina is in total folds 
you can see it's just kind of puckered there. It was difficult. Now, that's where you need that perchlorocarbon as a third hand. And after that, you can identify some more fixed folds or bands, and you can that way remove all these, uh, especially the tougher uh, uh, bands or some other band, and keep on injecting a little more. So in such situation, we all face, and these are the complex situations where we have to be, and here lens had to be removed because the whole thing in the periphery was as if, uh, you can see, this is the giant tear, which is still kind of uh, standing up like that. And, and uh, after this, again, as much as possible, the membranes were removed bit by bit. Keep on doing as much as possible without creating too many hydrogenic problems. And at times, it does happen in these cases uh, that you may have a short retina. Either your PFCL tend to go back, or when you do exchange, your air may go back. So what we do? Many a time I have seen somebody would say, I'll inject more PFCL, the biggest mistake. You have a short retina. So you need, you need not do that, because if you do that, the PFCL also goes behind. I think you need to take care of that. And then only, I think finally here, the oil was injected. And uh, I think uh, even in an extreme case like this, where nothing is seen, uh, ultimately, this is uh, after first surgery. This could settle like that, but still it is dragged down. And then uh, after s during silicone oil removal, this membrane was and uh, had at least uh, a vision which was uh, sufficient for uh, this child. So visual outcome in PVR is functional and anatomical outcomes are dependent on the severity of the disease. Posterior PVR is easily visualized and can be completely removed. And anterior PVR is more difficult to visualize and remove. I think I had uh, one video, I just took it out because it will take too much of time. And failed, uh, this is one uh, case which was sent to me, failed SV. Uh, and sometimes they are lucky. You see, this case somehow did so well, it uh, 612, which I never imagined that it would. And the prognosis, uh, anterior PVR has the worst prognosis because these are the cases which pose major challenge. Anatomical success will be anywhere between 60 to 80 percent for these kind of detachments. And you may have uh, in 40 to 80 percent something like 5 by 200 or better vision, as I have shown uh, one of uh, such cases. Single procedure has 60 percent chance of achieving 5 by 200. I think if you can fix these retina in single procedures, you are much more successful. If you have to go repeatedly in, I think that is what is shown. They have much lesser success. And the prevention, again, I would emphasize, remove all tractions from the retina during the primary surgery. Support all residual traction with uh, SB. If you're in the periphery, you can always put a band, which we do in PVR cases. We may not do otherwise in conventional, normal cases. But where we find we are not able to remove the hyaloid and we have a problem, and close all retinal breaks uh, meticulously. Avoid or use minimal cryo and use long-term tamponade like silicone oil. So uh, I would like to conclude that in recently performed SB in fake eyes, we form very often a skull buckling with moderate PBR. And especially in children, we tend to go for buckling in most situation until unless it is a really bad situation. So uh, we need complete membrane peeling. PFCL may be required as shown in one of the cases. Anterior vitreous-based dissection with lens remover oil removal in so some cases are required. I think we had to remove IL, uh, lens in that particular case. Use of retinotomy and retinectomy should be really very, very sparing. I think it because it could, uh, leads to, again, further PVR enhancement and long-term tamponade is essential. And so uh, I think most of the things I have covered, uh, so there's nothing uh, that I would like to repeat here. And so uh, any questions? So I have taken little more time. Dr. Vishali is not there, so I thought, uh, we still have little time. Any questions or any kind of a comments? 